This video is going to offer a brief overview of the diversity of sauropod dinosaurs. Now, the um, early Triassic dinosauromorphs evolved the ability to be bipedal, and the very first dinosaurs uh, were small, bipedal, and unspecialized. They lacked many of the traits which we associate with later dinosaurs, like you know, large body size, long necks, armor, horns, etc. The earliest dinosaurs had a hip that looked like this, where the pubic bone uh, was going forwards and the ischium had projected backwards. Now, a later group of dinosaurs would have the pubic bone going um, backwards, and the meat-eating dinosaurs most closely related to birds would do the same. But these original dinosaurs had this configuration. This was referred to as a saurician hip or a lizard hip as opposed to the ornithischian hip where the uh, hip goes backwards. And from the uh, mid-Triassic, there were two groups of saurischian dinosaurs, which would then diversify a great deal. Now, notice that, that at the beginning, they look the same. The earliest meat-eating dinosaurs and the earliest prosauropods, as we will say, as C, they look about the same. They were small, they were bipedal, they were relatively unspecialized. But over tens of millions of years, then they would change. And this lineage would adapt to eating plants. And if you eat plants, you can get to be big. And as they got big, then some uh, became uh, capable of uh, both bipedal and quadrupedal locomotion. And then some of those then became the sauropods, uh, which were obligate quadrupeds that uh, then uh, used uh, their arms for locomotion all the time and increased the lengths of their neck. So if you were to look in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, there was a big difference between the sauropods and the theropods. Um, but remember that in the mid-Triassic, they had come from comparable uh, ancestors and the differences between them had evolved over tens of millions of years. So this group of sauropods would include then the big quadrupedal animals, which we call sauropods, and then the smaller um, bipedal slash, you know, capable of quadrupedal locomotion um, group, the prosauropods, which, uh, we'll cover. Before getting into prosauropods and then, you know, the later sauropods, just a couple of notes about the group. First off, it is important to remember that the Mesozoic era, which starts 250 million years ago at the beginning of the Triassic and ends 65 million years ago um, with the end of the Cretaceous, is a really long time. And from the mid-Triassic through the Jurassic through the Cretaceous, um, you know, this is well over 150 million years that this group of sauropods um, had. And the world is a big place, as I'll continue in the next video. And then given that, given that this is an enormous length of time and that the world is a big place, um, it is not then surprising that out of the diversity that is found in this group, that they didn't all live together. So for example, here's a prosauropod that is known only from the Triassic period. So while there were sauropods in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, this was not one of them. It had a specific moment in time in which it lived. Uh, Thecodontosaurus from the late Triassic into the early Jurassic. Um, and I'll continue this. And, and so, uh, if one were to go to the Mesozoic and ask what sauropod dinosaurs one might see, uh, the question would then follow, what part of the Mesozoic? Because the sauropod diversity of the Cretaceous was very different from that of the Jurassic, very different from that of the Triassic. So individual dinosaur species only lived at specific moments in uh, time. And that then is true of uh, the sauropods as well. So this video just gives us uh, some examples of sauropods which are known in uh, the Triassic, early Jurassic, late uh, Jurassic, early Cretaceous, uh, late Cretaceous, um, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, that last photo was of uh, the Morris information at Dinosaur National Park in the United States, which is a great place to find sauropod uh, fossils as I'll get to a little later. So 
um, sauropods lived at different moments uh, in time, and they also lived in different parts of the world. Now, if you looked at, saw that map and compare it to a map of the world in the Triassic, over the period of the Mesozoic era, the continents changed. Um, at the beginning of the Mesozoic, uh, they were all fused to form the giant uh, supercontinent um, uh, Pangaea. Um, while later, um, at the end of the Triassic, um, North America began to separate from Africa, forming an Atlantic Ocean. As we get into the Cretaceous period, then these continents were drifting apart further, North America separating uh, from uh, Eurasia, and late in the Cretaceous, this giant block of Gondwana um, had begun to so South America was moving away from Africa. Uh, for uh, examples. So because SARS was involved at the time uh, all were together, they were able to watch, including Antarctica. No matter where you go in the world, you can find you know, sauropods in Asia, sauropods in South America, sauropods in Antarctica, sorry, Africa, and it's certainly uh, that one is considered, uh, given that at certain periods of time uh, the continents were together uh, and other times they were uh, separating, uh, then clearly this affected the distribution of uh, these uh, sauropods. So, which was just an obvious point. The world's a big, and the Mesozoic era was an enormous expanse of time. And so, individual species uh, were in specific parts of the world in specific um, blocks of uh, time. It's not as if they existed all throughout the Mesozoic on all places on Earth. Now, the later sauropods had longer necks. That was a, a distinguishing feature. And then one could obviously ask the question, well, how does one get a longer neck? And it turns out there are two ways. One is you could add a lot of extra vertebrae. So snakes today can have at least 100 vertebrae, but typically it's, you know, two to 300. And there was um, a fossil snake, which was closer to 500. When you look at the plesiosaurs and ask, how did they have such enormous um, necks? Uh, a main reason is that they added more vertebrae. And so ancestral ones might have had vertebrae counts like 12, 16, but then they got up to um, 39 here. And as we then get to later uh, plesiosaurs, it was much greater. Um, and so snakes have added uh, to uh, length by um, getting more vertebrae. Plesiosaurs added to the length of their neck. By getting more vertebrae. And so then an obvious question is, then how did, um, oh, and I'm sorry, before I do that, um, but there is another way. So if you were to ask, how did this giraffe get its longer neck? The answer is not that it has more vertebrae. I have seven um, uh, cervical uh, vertebrae, and so too does uh, this uh, giraffe. And so uh, giraffes have the same number of neck uh, vertebrae as uh, typical mammals do. They've just made the vertebrae that they have much longer. And so the um, uh, those are two different styles. You can add more vertebrae, you can lengthen the ones you have. So when we look at sauropods, how did their necks get so long? Well, the reality is it's a little bit of both, but primarily the lengthening of the vertebrae, which they already had. And so um, while uh, they uh, did have a few extra vertebrae, and as they lengthened their neck, there were some vertebrae in the thoracic region, which stretched so long that they actually um, went into uh, the neck. 19 is not an enormous number. I mean, you know, compared to, you know, 70 in a plesiosaur or hundreds, you know, along the body of a snake. So 19 is not an incredible number, primarily, if you were to say um, go to a museum and if you were to look at uh, why is this neck so long, it's not that it is hundreds of vertebrae. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six. There aren't hundreds of uh, vertebrae. Um, instead, uh, what happened is that uh, the individual vertebrae uh, just became uh, lengthened. All right, so uh, a long neck is one of the defining uh, features of uh, the uh, sauropods, and you know that was a, a comment on that. Um, when I was a kid, <coughs> and I looked at dinosaur books, and I did, um, some of the pictures would depict a sauropod at the bottom of a lake. So it's walking on the bottom of a lake, and then it's got its head above 
the water. And you couldn't help but think, oh, what a brilliant idea. No terrestrial um, uh, predators could find you. You could eat aquatic plants. Oh, that's perfect. Um, except it probably didn't happen that way. Uh, and we say that for a couple of reasons. One, these animals were so big that the pressure on their lungs, if you know they were trying to be this far down, would have made it very difficult to inflate um, uh, their lungs. Um, plus the fact when we look at their bodies, um, bodies which are adapting to aquatic life, like those plesiosaurs, which we had seen in the previous uh, video, uh, they start to change their legs for you know, uh, adaptation to aquatic environments. Sauropods show none of that. Sauropods have very stout uh, limbs and meant to support a huge body on land. And so the original idea, and this goes back to you know, early discoveries of sauropods, that they were largely aquatic, that they would have you know, lived and walked on the bottoms of lakes and the long neck allowed them to um, to extend their necks out of the water, um, that's false. That would have not have been their um, uh, their lifestyle. That being said, I'm sure they loved water. I mean, you and I, we aren't aquatic. All right, it's not like we're we're otters, we're dolphins. You know, there are aquatic mammals, but those which aren't aquatic, that isn't to say that they don't spend time in the water. You know, or, or like the water, or you know, adapt to you know environments near the water. Uh, and so there are plenty of footprints which were made in muddy ground. Um, as, we'll, as we'll get to, the, the teeth of sauropods uh, weren't good for chewing, so they probably would have you know, richly enjoyed soft aquatic uh, vegetation. So saying that they're not aquatic doesn't mean that they didn't like lakes and rivers and be found along the coast or wade into them. Uh, there is one uh, fossil uh, track bed which was found um, at one site uh, where, uh, so the point is that uh, sauropods were not aquatic reptiles. I just say that because that was a misconception early on. Um, and a couple of interesting things about sauropods in general. First off, where are the nostrils? Well, you'd assume here at the tip of the snout, that's not where they were, they migrated. And so there are two groups of sauropods. Notice the nostrils are not here. These have migrated on the back at a, uh, uh, more posteriorly, but there's still a pair of them. Um, this is Camarasaurus. Uh, on Diplodocus, the nostrils migrated farther and uh, were fused. Um, and so then the question uh, is, uh, you know, why is that? Um, don't know. And, and, and so that's one of the things of, about science. You know, you never get to a point where you know. I absolutely am I'm, you know, sure of this. And you always you know, try to uh, remain open to the idea that you know, there's some new interpretation. So for example, um, some of the animals which have fused nostrils at the top of the head today, like elephants or even tapirs to a, a lesser degree, have a trunk. Um, did sauropods have trunks? Um, we don't think so. Um, but we don't know if all you have are the bones, uh, just like if you just have the skull of an elephant, you know, you don't automatically assume, you know, that it had a, a trunk um, until you had seen a living elephant, you know, then you understand something. Uh, so I don't think these animals had, you know, a trunk, um, but this position of the nostril is consistent with some animals which did. So why did their nostrils move? Well, two thoughts. Uh, these were big animals that had to eat a lot. And so if you're always sticking your face into vegetation, if you're eating at the tops of trees, well, then maybe there's an advantage in moving the nostrils farther back on uh, the head. But as I get into their teeth in just a little bit, um, they probably did depend to some degree on aquatic vegetation. And if your nostrils are farther back on your head and you're eating aquatic vegetation, then that does have the advantage where your mouth can be in uh, the water grabbing this vegetation, but you could still be breathing um, with your uh, nostrils uh, above uh, the water line. And so, you know, this is an interesting feature of sauropods, and it probably had something to do with their ability, uh, you know, to feed more or perhaps uh, in aquatic uh, environments. Now, uh, when, I, when I teach, one of the things I, I'll say to my students is I'll say, all right, I'm going to say something and react as emotionally as, as you feel the need to. And I say, you chew your food. And I pause. And everyone just stares at me like, 
you know, well, obviously it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, so what? Doesn't everything chew its food? And the point is, no, virtually nothing chews their food. Mammals chew their food. Some groups of extinct dinosaurs, which I'll be talking about in the future, um, chew to their food. Most animals don't. For most animals, it's chomp, chomp, and swallow. And you can see that in sauropods. They were plant eaters. So you think, ah, oh, you know, plant material, don't you chew your food? No, the sauropods didn't, because look at their cheek teeth. They're just not there, all right? So they don't have cheek uh, teeth. So if you were to look uh, here, there's no cheek teeth for chewing. There's no cheek teeth for uh, chewing. And so sauropods, their teeth were these narrow peg-like structures in the, in the front of their mouth, which was good for stripping leaves. So they could strip leaves off branches. They could crop plants. Um, they could, you know, perhaps gather aquatic uh, vegetation. One sauropod had a, a duck-like bill or like a snout, like where it was wider. So maybe that helped it grab aquatic uh, uh, vegetation. But they certainly did not chew their uh, food. They just didn't have chewing teeth. So they would have swallowed their food uh, whole and then um, would have processed it more in uh, their digestive tract. Now, some animals today and some dinosaurs, including sauropods, could eat stones. And then these stones could then be in the stomach. And so as the stomach moved, then the plant material would actually be grinding between these stones. So we grind our food in between teeth. And some animals use stones called gastroliths, which they swallow, um, to grind food. Also, these animals had such an enormous size and the plant material that they ate would just sit and ferment for a longer amount of time and be acted on by microbes. So that was another strategy. Um, uh, you know, just if you're going to be that big, the food's going to spend just more time in a digestive tract and maybe the necessary nutrients can be extracted uh, that uh, way. And so this is, you know, perhaps just interesting to uh, keep in uh, mind um, because when we talk about some of the ornithischian dinosaurs, they actually modified their cheek teeth to make this dental battery which allowed chewing. Now that's really special. So ornithischian dinosaurs could chew their food, but ma that made them unique among reptiles. And mammals, we chew our food. That makes us unique among the animals alive uh, today. So chewing food is the exception to the rule where you have these grinding cheek teeth which touch each other. Most animals didn't have it, um, and the sauropods uh, certainly uh, did not. Um, now, as uh, the animals uh, diversified, uh, and you've probably gotten this impression, uh, we could see differences. And uh, for example, here in these two skulls of Diplodocus on the left and Camarasaurus on the right, here this uh, animal, its skull was more elongated uh, and the nostrils were fused at the top. Uh, here the uh, nostrils are paired um, and the, and the skull is uh, more robust. Uh, and this correlates with other um, aspects of their physiology as well. So later, if we were to ask, who is the biggest of the sauropods? How big did they get? Uh, well, these uh, sauropods of the Camarasaurus you know, group, uh, they were very stocky and very heavily built. Uh, these were longer and thinner. And so you could have one of these being much longer than one of these, but this one was then heavier. And so as we talk about size, you know, th then there's different ways of measuring size. So once again, um, some of these could be very long but light, and some of these could be not quite as long but far heavier. And, and so uh, there were different groups of these, uh, of these sauropods. Uh, now, we'd obviously love to know uh, how uh, they lived. There are trackways which suggest that large numbers of animals could be moving uh, in the same direction at the same time. So maybe there was some sort of communal living. Um, some trackways have even preserved you know, bigger footprints on the outside, smaller footprints on the middle. So maybe this is a form of parental care, all right, where you know, the, the larger individuals protect the younger in uh, the middle of uh, the group, um, which would have been interesting because obviously they didn't have uh, that uh, large uh, a brain. Uh, 
Um, and just a comment then on their heads. Um, their heads are rather small. So if you were to look at the ends of these long necks, that's a tiny head for such a big animal. And at first that, sound, that looks weird. Like why would you put such a small head on that animal? I mean, that, that small head would have to be eating constantly. You'd have to never stop eating um, uh, because of, uh, you know, just the size of the head, you know, is that smart? Um, but then the, you know, the other answer is, well, there's no way that you could have a big head. If you had a big head at the end of such a long neck, it would be so heavy to lift. And so um, uh, they needed to have small heads just because of these long necks. And that could then beg the question of why did they have such long uh, necks? And then one of the answers, uh, you know, quite possibly is if you don't have chewing teeth, then you can't just eat any old plants because a lot of plants are going to, you know, have thick leaves. Uh, that are maybe just too fibrous for you to ingest well. So if you're, you, if you don't have chewing teeth, maybe you want to get the tenderest leaves. So maybe that would be at the very tops of trees. So now you could be a selective eater, all right? And now you know, just go for you know the, the softest of, of leaves and avoid woody material closer to the ground, let's say. Or um, you know, this allows you, if you're going to feed on aquatic plants, maybe you could be standing on the land and now your long neck is accessing aquatic uh, uh, plants, uh, you know, away from uh, the shore. So just a couple of thoughts. A few other thoughts just in general, and I'm sorry, I think, uh, I apologize for my phone ring. Um, this was, I think, what I was about to say. Uh, there is one trackway where one sauropod is, um, apparently walking in a riverbed because all you see are the front uh, footprints, the back of the animal was apparently floating in the water. So once again, it's not aquatic the way, say, an otter would be or a dolphin would be, um, but certainly, you know, they appear to have liked the water. Um, uh, some of the later groups, uh, as a way of making their skeleton lighter, evolved as spaces in vertebrae called pleuroceles, which helped because now their back was just less solid. If this was solid bone, oh, I mean, that would be an incredible uh, weight uh, to bury. But if it had these spaces inside known as pleuroceles, that would make the, the spine easier uh, to lift. If you were going to study, you know, fossil finds, you, you might find great descriptions um, of, say, vertebrae. One of the reasons for that is uh, that when you have such a big animal, um, very often you don't have a complete skeleton to study as a fossil. So that makes sense. I mean, if you have, if an animal is this big, obviously a rock which preserves part of the animal could very easily, you know, uh, you know, preserve another part of the animal. But if the animal is 60 feet long or 100 feet long, it's not that uncommon to have, you know, the head of a sauropod, but not the body, or much of the body, but not the head, or not the limbs. So sometimes, you know, there's a lot of attention uh, placed on, say, vertebrae. That may be all you have at this fossil. So you study what you have, obviously. Um, and there were some vertebrae which were interesting. So for example, a margosaurus is a South American sauropod, which had lengthened um, neural processes on its uh, vertebrae, uh, which, you know, gave it a bit of a sail. We don't know why, perhaps, once again, for thermoregulation. Would this help you warm up on a cold day? If you're this huge animal, obviously you might have difficulty in losing heat. So would the sail you know, help you to lose heat on a windy day? Uh, you know, so that's a, a possibility. Once again, uh, the teeth of sauropods tended to be narrow and uh, peg-like. Uh, not uh, for uh, chewing. And once again, we don't really see any um, uh, any adaptations of the legs for aquatic life. These are really stout bones, uh, which uh, help support enormous uh, animals. Now, some of the prosauropods, as I'll mention, uh, they had uh, claws, um, but um, for the most part, sauropods didn't have much in the way of protection. There were a couple of ones which had armor or even a tail club, but they were the exceptions. And the answer seems to be um, that if you're this big, you don't need anything else. Size is your defense. Now, one of the classrooms that I used to teach at, um, there was a, a skull of a moose with antlers on the wall, and that was a great room to teach this class in, because I would 
uh, point to the moose. And I would say, why do you think they have those antlers? You know, it seems like defense and, and maybe you think like defense against wolves. But clearly not, that's not the case because only male moose have antlers and only during mating season. If this was a defense against wolves, then all the moose would have it and you'd have it all throughout the year. Um, so that's just for males to fight with each other. Well, then how do you protect yourself against the wolves? Because you're so big. Just if, because of the size of a move, moose, if it lands a kick on a wolf, the wolf doesn't get up again. And the same thing here, and this is depicted in the Museum of Natural History of New York City, which I highly recommend that you visit. You know, you go into the main lobby from the Central Park side, um, and you're struck by this huge animal, but you forget, here's a huge animal. So here's an allosaurus, all right, and it's 20, 30 feet long, um, but you don't even see it, all right, because of how big this thing is. So even this, this is a huge predator, you know, a 20 something foot long predator, that's a huge predator. Um, but if this thing were to land on it, um, the allosaurus wouldn't get up again. And, and so uh, for the most part, size was their defense. Now, there were a couple small sauropods. There were some which had a reduced size of their necks uh, even. Um, but these smaller sauropods, they were then more likely to have some sort of armor in their skin, a dermal bone, or uh, uh, one uh, had a club tail. So, you know, that almost emphasizes uh, that previous point. If size is your defense, then um, if you're going to reduce your size, then you need another defense. Okay, so uh, uh, that's a little bit of information about sauropods in general. Now going into individual ones. Uh, once again, uh, the first dinosaurs were small bipedal animals. And one of them, the first groups of, uh, of dinosaurs were called prosauropods. So I just like to, to, to you know, emphasize a point I had made before. Not all dinosaurs uh, lived at the same time. Prosauropods were one of the dinosaurs' earliest success stories. When you looked at the dinosaurs spreading throughout the world in the late Triassic, the meat-eating theropods and the prosauropods, they were the dinosaur success stories. But by the early Jurassic, the prosauropods were extinct. So um, not only did dinosaurs evolve at different times, they went extinct at different times. So they didn't all go to extinct together in, you know, when the meteorite hit uh, the planet uh, 65 million years ago. Uh, many groups of dinosaurs were long gone prior to that, including the prosauropods. They were one of the dinosaurs' early successes. They were also the dinosaurs' first failure, if you will, in that uh, it's a lineage which became uh, extinct, perhaps because they weren't chewing their food and then they lost out to competition with small ornithicians which were chewing their food and the larger sauropods which could be more selective with the way they ate. The very first sauropods were bipedal. They were very much like these, um, uh, the first uh, dinosaurs. Um, but they seem to be adapting to uh, then eating plants. We assume this from you know, the teeth that uh, they have. Um, now, if you eat plants, we know that you can get big. Right, so when you think of elephants, when you think of horses, when you think of cows, when you think of rhinos, um, you know, plant eaters can get to be a big size. You know, there's a lot of green stuff out there. And so as these, you know, Triassic animals adapted to eating plants, some of them got to be bigger. And as they got to be bigger, then bipedal locomotion became more difficult. So some of them would have been obligate bipeds, all right? So bipedal locomotion would have been their primary form of locomotion. If you look at their hands, their hand bones are rather thin. They would have been grasping for, you know, grabbing branches and the like. So there's a number of prosauropods, which were bipedal. As they got bigger uh, and more top heavy, then there would have been some which were capable of both. So they could have stood on their hind legs, and maybe that would have helped them reach higher branches of uh, plants. But at the same time, they were also now capable of walking on uh, their hands. So, you know, there were uh, sauro uh, pro sauropods, which were capable of both bipedal and quadrupedal uh, locomotion. By the end, the, um, uh, the pro sauropods included some larger forms, which would have been obligate quadrupeds. So that quadrupedal locomotion would have been their primary 
uh, form of locomotion. And all of the sauropods uh, would then have been primarily quadrupedal. Now, that display in the Museum of Natural History, you see a sauropod on its hind legs, you know, with the idea that it could come down on uh, a theropod. You know, that would be a different case. That wouldn't be, you know, a primary form of locomotion. That would now say be a, um, you know, a defense mechanism, you know, in an emergency. So here the prosauropods are these wonderful transitional forms. And for example, this one, Platyosaurus would be a wonderful transitional form. So the first uh, dinosaurs and the first group members of the group saur sauropoda, uh, the, the prosauropods, they were small and bipedal. The later ones would be huge and quadrupedal. But then here we have an intermediate form, a transitional form. Uh, it uh, is intermediate in size, um, but also now it's capable of both quadrupedal and bipedal locomotion. Um, so it would have been able to walk on its hind legs, although it would have been very slow if it had done that. Um, but standing on its hind legs certainly would have helped it uh, then uh, to reach uh, leaves, you know, higher in the trees. So the pro prosauropods are just, you know, wonderful trans, you know, set of transitional forms showing how the uh, highly derived sauropods could have evolved in uh, stages and that, you know, locomotion can change in stages. You can go from being bipedal to then a mix of bipedal and quadrupedal uh, to then uh, fully uh, quadrupedal. And so when we look at the, um, uh, the group uh, of sauropods. Uh, it would be wise then to begin with the prosauropods, which were among the earliest dinosaurs known. Uh, and so it's starting in the mid-Triassic, there were um, uh, prosauropods, I think southern continents, uh, like South America, Africa, uh, places where very early uh, prosauropods uh, are known. Uh, the earliest ones were bipedal, and as then tens of millions of years passed uh, into the late um, Triassic, even into the Jurassic, when the last of them lived, then some of them became uh, larger and then were capable of, you know, quadrupedal uh, locomotion. Right. Um, but they then became extinct at the uh, beginning of the Jurassic period. Um, but they were replaced by the sauropods, the true sauropods, which descended from prosauropod ancestors. Um, in the sauropods, now they were four footed so that the arms had then changed. They were no longer made of, you know, uh, thin, nimble bones, but they were now uh, stouter um, for bearing uh, the body's uh, weight. Uh, if you were to go to the Museum of Natural History in uh, Philadelphia, uh, which was the country's uh, first Museum of Natural History, uh, first place where um, uh, dinosaur bones were on display, I believe, in the world, um, you know, so highly recommend that. Um, you can see the following display, but before I get there, here's an alligator and you can look at just regular reptiles have bones, you know, like uh, in the arm, the humerus, the radius, the ulna, the carpals, the metacarpals, etc. Um, now, uh, the first dinosaurs had smaller arms. You know, here's the Tyrannosaurus rex, which made it even smaller, obviously. Um, some of these arms were then adapted to be wings in the theropods. So the wings of a bird are made of the same arm bones uh, that the theropod dinosaurs and, and regular uh, reptiles have in their, um, uh, in their arms. Um, but the sauropods, they then adapted their arms uh, for a quadrupedal locomotion. And then if you were to look and once again, the Museum of Natural History in Philadelphia has a great example on the walls of just uh, the arms of sauropods. And then if you were, you know, here I've drawn a person just for scale. So whether you look at Diplodocus or the enormous Ultrasaurus, you can see there's a humerus. I have a humerus, regular reptiles do, so do these dinosaurs. Then there's the forearm that is, uh, includes the bones of the radius and uh, the ulna. Uh, then that attaches to carpal bones. Um, and then this uh, attaches to uh, metacarpals and then phalanges. Now sauropods reduced some of these um, because apparently like small bones would probably be more um, brittle if you were waiting, uh, uh, you know, supporting your entire body on this. So if you look at the number of phalanges, it's not like we have like proximal, middle, and distal phalanges that are thin. Here you see a smaller number of 
phalanges and they're stout. Probably, you know, if you had thinner bones, you know, they could be crushed by the weight of these huge um, animals. Um, but if you look at then their arms, their arms are made of the same bones that are found in a normal reptile's arms. Uh, uh, the first uh, dinosaur arms were then even our arms. And then also then uh, just notice, we'll get to size in just uh, a second. Here you see the arm of uh, you know, a sauropod could be, you know, three times the size, you know, the height of a human. So these were uh, huge uh, animals. Um, most dinosaurs had arms which were smaller, shorter than their legs. The first dinosaurs were bipedal with arms that were shorter than their legs. And with almost all dinosaurs, that's the case. Even things like the armored stegosaurus or triceratops, um, they're four footed, but their heads are pretty low to the ground because the arms are just shorter than the legs were. Uh, and in most sauropods, that was uh, that way as well. Uh, there were a couple of exceptions, like Brachiosaurus is unusual among dinosaurs. Its arms became so long that the arms were actually longer than the legs. So that's unusual. That was unlike the first dinosaurs and unlike almost all of the other dinosaurs. And undoubtedly, this gave it a great ability you know, to reach the tops of trees. Brachiosaurus was one of those stout uh, dinosaurs. So it wasn't the longest but at 50 to 60 tons, it was certainly one of the heaviest. So Diplodocus could be 90 feet long, um, but would have only been a fraction of that weight, maybe 10 to 20 tons, whereas Brachiosaurus, say 50 to 60 tons, um, and being not uh, quite as long, but once again, uh, being stouter. And so as the Jurassic, so the very first sauropods are known from the a uh, late Triassic period, the end of the Triassic period. And then going into the Jurassic, uh, the sauropods were kind of in their height. Um, they would continue into the Cretaceous period, uh, but they would not be as successful as they were in the Jurassic. And North America was without sauropods, as far as we can tell, for much of the Cretaceous, only being colonized uh, by apparently uh, south, uh, uh, sauropods from South America at the end of the uh, Cretaceous. So there are many groups uh, within the sauropods, so it's it's a family tree and, you know, different branches of the family tree. There were primitive uh, sauropods, the whale lizards or cediosaurs, um, you know, things like this and, and like camarasaurs. They were stout animals, uh, which were very robust. The earliest ones uh, were missing those pleuroceles, which made their uh, vertebral columns uh, lighter. Uh, some of the later ones actually got a little bit of body armor or even a club on the tail. Uh, there were, you know, the stout, uh, you know, brachiosaurs, uh, but then there were the much uh, thinner relatives of apatosaurus and diplodocus, where their bodies and their skulls were longer and thinner. So, uh, you know, here's even one that had a much shorter neck and apparently fed closer to uh, the ground. And so if we put all of these, you know, sauropods together and we studied their anatomy, we would realize that this uh, represents the branching of a family tree. Sauropod lineages uh, evolved over uh, time. And then there would be, you know, features which would be true of various lineages. Um, now, uh, you know, an obvious question is how big could they get? Uh, and the answer is, since you are very often dealing with incomplete fossils, not having the full animal, you know, sometimes you're estimating size, you know, based on the front half of this one or the legs of this one or the vertebrae of this one. I read once that uh, there was a vertebra which had been found but then lost in one of the World Wars or World War II. So that was, you know, another problem that, you know, you can put uh, dinosaur fossils in museums, you know, but in, in Europe, for example, some of the museums were bombed and some material was lost. Um, but there was a partial vertebra which was six feet tall. It's estimated that the whole vertebra would have been eight feet tall. And then if you estimate, you know, how big the animal would have been, well, you know, some estimates would say be 200 feet long. But then that being said, you hate to, you know, place all of your confidence in uh, a body estimate based on part of one bone. Um, so there have been a number of uh, ones which have been uh, estimated to be more than 100 feet long. 
But then there's been subsequent analysis where, you know, 80, 90 feet, that seems to be an upper limit for many of them, with one exception, um, one of them which was truly longer than 100 feet long, maybe 120 or more, is Argentinosaurus in South America. So Argentinosaurus uh, was an enormous a sauropod, and as far as we know, uh, the largest one and the only one which we can definitely affirm was over 100 feet long, although there were a number of other ones which were close, and so as more fossils or more complete fossils are found, then things like, you know, Ultrasaurus and Seismosaurus, etc., they, they may also have been more than 100 uh, feet uh, long. Um, one last uh, thing is uh, in the United States. Um, a lot of the west of the United States includes uh, rock layers referred to as the Morrison for Formation formed in uh, the mid-Jurassic. Uh, and a lot of fossils uh, from this area, and this is Dinosaur National Park, uh, where you know I'm photographing here, and this is the Morrison uh, Formation, that rock layer. Uh, they've provided sauropod fossils, which are now on display in other countries. And that uh, sauropod in the Museum of Natural History in New York City, that was unearthed here. So obviously you can be on display in New York City, but that doesn't mean you were found in New York City. So it was found here. And at Dinosaur National Park, if you ever get a chance to go, there is an enclosed area where you can see this rock uh, wall uh, that has lots of dinosaur bones still embedded in it. All right, and so this seems to be the um, remains of an old riverbed. And so when animals died, you know, currents could then take them to a part of the river where they tended to uh, then just, you know, like uh, rest and uh, were buried and many were, um, uh, uh, were preserved there. Camarasaurus is the primary sauropod which is known uh, from uh, this uh, formation. It's the most abundant uh, one uh, which has uh, been found. Um, and uh, there is a, a Camarasaurus uh, skull which is still embedded in uh, the wall. Um, but, uh, and, and that would, uh, uh, but then like I said, the, um, uh, the museum specimens of uh, other uh, spec uh, of other dinosaurs were found here at Morrison, including a diversity of uh, sauropods such as Diplodocus and uh, Apatosaurus and other animals um, uh, as well. So if you ever get a chance to go to Dinosaur National Park, uh, you know, it's certainly, you know, amazing to, to actually stand, uh, you know, in front of, you know, all of these dinosaur uh, remains uh, still in situ. So, um, starting with the prosauropods, uh, this was one of dino the, the dinosaurs' earliest successful groups. So, you know, when dinosaurs first started to spread throughout the world, prosauropods were one of the uh, the great um, the great groups which began, and the great sauropods evolved uh, from them. So, they uh, lasted the length of the Mesozoic era from the mid Triassic to the end of the Cretaceous, as far as we can tell. Although the Jurassic period probably would have been uh, the time when they reached uh, their greatest diversity. And this video has just you know, been a, a, an overview of some of the features of sauropods and some of their diversity.